everyone, and welcome to So Very Wrong About Games, a board gaming podcast about board games. With me is the man we call The Show, Michael Walker. How you doing, Walker? Fantastic, Mark. How are you today? I'm very well, thanks. I am indeed Mark Bigney, who is not, as we call it, The Show. And I just want to say that I got to wish several people a happy Arkhipov Day last Friday. And I got to explain to everybody I wished a happy Arkhipov Day what Arkhipov Day is. And next year, I hope I'll be able to be slightly better on the ball and give people more advanced warning because uh, I, I I miss the old buildup. You know, it was half conscious, half accidental that he didn't do the buildup for the full month. But I think going forward, given if we're since we're trying to invent a holiday from whole cloth, I think we should <laughs> exert the necessary effort and announce it at least a month in advance. And not only this is Happy Arkhipov episode, this is also the Halloween episode. Oh. And so we've got this whole thing planned. It's going to be the super scary, spooky <laughs> show. Full of jump scares. What's that behind you, Walker? Oh, no. Or something. Boo. All right. So how's that? That We're going to have to workshop that, that, I oh, think. Oh, okay. I'll yeah. fix it in post. All right. Good stuff. Yeah. <laughs> that echoey, you know, deep throat. Yeah. It'll, it'll be great. I'll edit in that creaky door opening nice. that everyone uses, followed by that scream that everyone uses. Sweet. It'll be great stock images. So, great stock audio, rather. So, this is a board gaming podcast about board games. We're going to talk about the game we reviewed last year, the as-yet-unnamed retrospective intro segment. We're going to talk about the games we played last week, the news, and why it doesn't matter. And our topic this week is updating the canon. So, we have the So Very Wrong About Games canon on the website. We haven't updated it in some time, and so I thought it would be a good exercise to do so live. And we'll be talking more about that later. So, Walker, what did we review last year? We reviewed a game called Bitoku, and I still have it on my shelf. I still wish to play it multiple times. There's an expansion coming out for it soon. This was put out by Devier Game, yet yet another fantastic Devier game designed by German P. Milan. It is a game where you are doing sort of worker placement combined with deck building and all sorts of craziness ensues. Yeah, so Bitoku, I think, for me, falls squarely into one of those things that I'd be willing to play if someone suggested, but I haven't thought too, too much about since we reviewed it. I haven't played it since we reviewed it, and I don't know that that fills me with regret. I've thought about it here and there. You know, I see announcements of the expansion. I thought, yeah, 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 Bitoku was was kind of fun. And I was reminded also when we played the follow-up design by uh, Herman P. Milan, namely Sabika, which I did not enjoy nearly as much. I thought it was a very you know, relatively plodding Euro game in comparison. But Patoku has its charms, and it's certainly very pretty. Yeah, it has two very distinct art styles. as one very sort of traditional and, and art, I shouldn't say artistic. They're very both artistic, <laughs> but sure. anyway, two very distinct types of art in the game. Yeah, very naturalistic, as well as a slightly more mythologically inspired heavy brush element. And yeah, I like all the, the art elements. As I say, the visual appeal is undeniable. Uh, it's one of those things where it's there's, there's a fair amount of rules grit. You know, the, the rules explanation is no joke. And it mostly bears that weight well. I, I, it doesn't scream that it needs simplifying, but I don't think that it would it would win any awards for elegance. Yeah, and, big, big setup. Yeah. Double-layered game board, which it's is true. interesting. Like lots of little inserts to lock in and stuff like that. So yeah. So suffice to say, when the expansion comes, I suspect you'll be getting it, and I'll be happy to see what the expansion adds, but uh, suffice to say, I don't have, I'm not eagerly looking forward to that day, speaking personally, but you would have been happier if over the course of the past year, we would have played it some more. Agreed. Ah, there we go. So that is the as yet unnamed retrospective intro segment, the Aguirus Bitoku. So Walker, what'd you play last week? Well, we'll get this one out of the way, Mark. This is a game called <laughs> Imperial Miners. This is a game put out by Portal Games and designed by Tim Armstrong. I'm wondering, Mark, can a game be so inoffensive <laughs> that it becomes offensive? Yes. The answer is yes. Well, then, good. This is Imperial Miners. <laughs> oh, my goodness. That oh, bad, Oh, huh? my goodness. There's nothing wrong with the game itself. It is right. fine. It's just so pedestrian that it's painful. So, it it is... Okay. So I understand that it is riffing on the Imperial Settlers formula that 
in, or, in a way. Okay, well, at least in terms of branding, yes. it's riffing on Imperial Settlers. Yes, it's but, saying it's been so conquered on the surface, it's now time to go underground. So says the <laughs> But But in terms of gameplay, you're asserting that it is considerably different. It's so effervescently light <laughs> and brings nothing, to me, brings nothing. You, you simply uh, play a card, they're numbered one through four, and they go in those rows one through four. And you have to have a card above it in order to play a card below. That's the only building cost. Though there's some cost on the cards. Okay. Yeah, so there's cost on the cards and you have to be able to place it. And then you work your way back up to the top. by act- You activate the card you played and then you activate all the way up to the top and then your top board has like three different options. And then you do that for ten turns. I see. Imperial Settlers. <laughs> So it was not one of those light games that bowled you over with its simplicity. It was a light game that bowled you over with its pointlessness. Just so. I see. I see. I was imagining, based on nothing more than seeing a single screenshot of the game, I did not play Imperial Miners with you, that it might be the Imperial Settlers formula and or 51st State Master Set formula with a weird sort of spatial element of the cards. This is exactly what I thought as well. Ah. This is exactly why I ordered it. (laughs) This is not what I got. <laughs> okay, good to know. Good to know. Because I, I it it I was disappointed to hear that you were so disappointed by Imperial Miners. But to be frank, I wouldn't have been shocked even if it had been riffing on 51st State Master Set and Imperial Settlers because those uh, those games, especially 51st State, are really close to the incredibly cookie cutter bland tableau builders that dominated the market about five years ago and possibly even a few years uh, after that. So if it had nonetheless messed with the formulas in the wrong way, I could easily imagine that it ended up becoming something super bland and forgettable. But it seems like it wasn't even that that was the problem of Imperial Miners. I was surprised when I saw that it was it was something, again, trading in that brand, but not having anything to do with Ignacy Trevacek in terms of the designing credits. So there you have it. There you have it. <laughs> Imperial Miners, Walker's new favorite game. Yikes. On the topic of very similar sounding games and games with names that are easily mixed up with each other, I played more Imperium Legends. This is by Nigel Buckle and David Zertze, the same co-designers as Voidfall. They've very much been on the mind lately. And there's a local who became uh, rather infatuated with the designs, as well he should. And so we got together to play a couple of rounds. The first round we played was very sort of bog standards. He played the Persians and I played the Egyptians. And the game was actually very, very quick because... In Imperium Classics and Legends, some nations start with the glory cards in their starting decks, and some nations don't. They have to build towards it. Some don't have it at all, but most do. And if they both start with glory in their starting decks, that is the thing that allows them to access the so-called victory cards. And if you're both burning through that, the game will end rather precipitously. And I kind of saw that coming and, and knew it was a thing, so I didn't have enough time to really exploit the empire advantages of Egypt. Egypt loves being a civilized nation for as long as possible and just sitting in an empire and putting out things like moneylenders and bureaucracy and all that other kind of scribing stuff. Didn't really get there. Instead, the military conquering engine led to a very quick endgame. But nonetheless, uh, I, I really appreciated that because, again, the character of the nations involved and of the empires involved in Imperium really do drive a lot of the tempo. And it really emphasizes how, with a Similar set of rules, you get tremendous amount of texture and flavor in the overall civilization building feel that you get in Imperium. The second game we played, we decided to go off the deep end and we both played made up civilizations that don't really have any historical antecedents, strictly speaking, namely the Utopians who are looking for Shangri-La and the Arthurians who are looking for the Grail. Now, granted, there are various historical bits you can point to that maybe kind of serve as the backbone for the inspiration for these myths, but at the end of the day, these are made-up civilizations, certainly in the form they take in Imperium. We joked that basically we were both fundamentally looking for the same thing. We were both fundamentally questing for some kind of pseudo-utopian enlightenment kind of salvation-based destination. You wanted evidence, Mark. You wanted to be. Mm, I don't know about evidence. Uh, that, I don't know if that's the right paradigm, but I, I, I hear what you're saying. But the joke was that despite the fact that we were both interacting with each other and we were both kind of questing, we both 
understood our goals and our methods to be radically different. So we just had these jokes about the two civilizations talking past each other the entire time. Like they would see portents everywhere, but then they would try to talk about what the portent looked like or what it might portend. And they'd be like, what are you talking about? That makes no sense. Anyway. I'd be like, do you have a portend? And they'll say, no, we already have one. And then he'll look behind him and says, I told him we already had one. Sure. Anyway. <laughs> And both the Utopians and the Arthurians have strange rules. There's a very, very small number of uh, civilizations in Imperium that have strange rules. Now, they're all basically built into the cards. There's a couple of lines in the rulebook that emphasize how strange they are. And I really, again, very, very, very different kind of feel. Now, some people object to the more uh, elaborated civilizational decks because they do feel a little bit more like you are navigating the constraints and the abilities of that specific deck more so than dealing with the available card offer and dealing with the other deck building elements. I don't mind having that option. If it were always one way or the other, I might object. I mean, this is, this is a common bugbear of a, of games with asymmetry where the more quote unquote complex ones, you're more dealing with their mechanisms rather than the other mechanisms of the game. And if that were the only way the game ever worked, then I don't know that Imperium would please me as much as it does. But the fact that you can go from these incredibly similar civilizations to these incredibly bespoke ones with very weird niche feelings, I very much appreciate. And it again makes me very enthusiastic to see what Imperium Horizons is going to look like with 19 whole new civilizations, some of which existing, some of which non-existent. So there we go. So more love and more ex experience of Imperium Legends by Nigel Buckle and David Sertze, published in 2021 by Osprey Games. On to another sort of lighter card game. I got to play NAR again. NAR is by Thomas DuPoint and put out by Bombix. And it is a fantastic Viking-themed, fast-paced Lots of choice card game where you're building a small tableau on the bottom of your board and a small tableau on the top and you're, you're cycling cards and you're also trying to go up a track. They'll get you points every turn. You are triggering special abilities on cards, all sorts of interesting things. Nar, it's all in a little box. Tiny, adorable little box. We went back to My Island, the campaign of Reiner Knizia, the follow-up to My City. And I recall, Walker, that a few chapters ago, you would express a disappointment that there weren't enough scoring conditions and that there, thus you felt that the sessions were more leading up to something rather than being satisfying in and of themselves. So I have a question for you. Do you still feel that way now? No, today, <laughs> today, this, these games, it was there. It's finally, yeah. finally you know, filled out and come into fruition and it is now a joy to play. It is now the case after getting to uh, chapter three, which includes sessions seven, eight, and nine, that I suppose this is a mild spoiler. So skip to the next chapter if you don't want to hear anything about my island. We're not at the point where every kind of space has a potential scoring element attached to it. And as a consequence, that interacts with everything, and so every tile placement forecloses other possibilities. You cannot build clusters uh, to satisfy every scoring condition at all times. And so the moment that second card gets flipped and everyone looks at the new tile to place, everyone immediately is like, well, I guess there go my hopes and dreams. <laughs> and the tension, therefore, is just through the roof. I really feel like it's no longer this pleasant, lightweight family game. It's instead a really agonizing, tense series of trade-offs, nonetheless, within a very, very simple rule set. In other words, it's one of those really difficult Reiner Knizia tile-laying games that I personally adore. Yeah, and it really, it, it emphasizes the the early and late game. The Like, the first few placements are, placements are so crucial because you always have to match at least one type of terrain with the new tile you're placing. Unless you're me and you just cheat and just put whatever tile you, you haven't want. done that for like three whole <laughs> games walker no need it. to keep hammering on about that although i will but it was funny and <laughs> so because you could get really in a lot of trouble with that first tile if you just sort of like you know tuck it in a corner or like it's only a two tile that comes up and you might be in trouble right off the beginning and now we have yeah i can't say spoilers but anyway lots, lots of, of, in interesting lots of interesting scoring conditions scoring yes and it's also the case that we now have competitive scoring conditions. 
So a little bit more player interaction, a little bit more care about what other people are doing on their boards than there was before. Not a whole heck of a lot. It's, you know, we're still all playing on our own boards and we're all trying to maximize our own scoring conditions given the same or a series of tile flops. But this is basically where I was expecting my island to go. Like, when you express those reservations, I'm like, mm, if this develops the same way that my city does, or in parallel lines, or even in just in the same broad strokes, I suspect you're going to be satisfied pretty soon. And it's uh, I, what I was not expecting, and what I do not remember from my city, is how incredibly agonizing all these placements are. Because it really is the case. With every tile placement, you're foreclosing a series of possibilities. And that's just what you have to do. And everyone is in the same boat. So if you really like those agonizing series of trade-offs, I think my island is the way to go. If you want something a little friendlier, I think my city is a little bit friendlier, to be frank, based on my recollections. There's fun gambling, too. There's... there's... <laughs> There's like it's like I we need, don't do gambling on the show. I, I need that one that one yep. piece, and so <laughs> so you can keep just deciding not to place tiles and and taking point losses. Yep, and hoping that you're going to get that one piece that you need before you lose too many points. Fantastic. Yes. So my island continues to delight. I am looking forward always to see what next chapter brings. I believe at the end of finishing this chapter, you actually wanted to open the next envelope just to see what the spoilers yeah, were. Just, <laughs> just a you know. A, a little Now you can live, live in dream. That's right. Just wonder what's going to show up. So that is My Island by Reiner Knizia, published by Cosmos. Well, the last year we did was G.I. Joe, the deck building game. And I was lucky enough to get it back to the table. And this time, more specifically, with the new alliances, a Transformers crossover expansion, Mark. That was been sitting in the box forever. And we went all out this time, Mark. It was a box, and now it has transformed into a game? Exactly. We Yikes. We, <laughs> yeah, that was weak. We, we stripped everything out. I'll fix it in post. We, <laughs> we stripped all the other expansions out. We we actually played it the way the rulebook said. We we switched cards from the, the basic game and just played the actual way that the book wanted us to play this Transformers expansion. Oh, so you've been freelancing the other times. Oh, yeah. yeah. We just throw everything in. Oh, okay. <laughs> I didn't know that. I didn't know that that was technically uh, in contravention of the the, the spirit of the rule. You got to look at the the light the the type of game it is, Mark. And Fair enough. It, yes, exactly. More toys versus less toys. There's a clear answer. And we lost, which was fine. Still had fun. It was one of these things. There's in GI Joe the deck building game. You have this sort of uh, track you go up to see if and if you get it's sort of like a threat meter. Say if it gets too high, you lose. It's shaped like a snake. It's for it cobra is. and. The odd part is the whole game, it was hovering at the very bottom until it wasn't. (laughs) It shot up to the top so quickly and we lost so, so badly, but it was very interesting. Anyway, long story short, uh, the Transformers come out, you pay a huge price to get them out, but you can take them in two different ways. You can use them as a transport because every time you go on a mission in G.I. Joe, the deck building game, you have to take a transport. Oh, that's wild. That's You can all hop in a, in a, in a Transformer as long as they're a, a sort of, a, a car big enough. Yes. Like you're not going to all hop in a motorcycle. You're not all going to get into Bumblebee no. either. Yeah, yeah. Or you can take them as part of the mission, right? And they're all going to give you different abilities depending on how you take them. And then, of course, we use the mission. Wait, wait, wait. Let, me, let me get this straight. I just want to clarify something. As a Transformers fan, the idea here is that, you know, Rodimus Prime shows up or whomever. And you basically, Rodimus Prime will do one of two things. He will either help you perform the mission or he will drive you to the mission, but he will not do both. Well, he does. He does a little bit of help. He doesn't do as much help. <laughs> Why? Because he's tired. Like, I don't. I don't understand. Well, I, I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure it's the, it's the same amount of help, but it all depends on how uh, how he goes back. Like, so if you just take him as a as a transport, he'll go back as a transport later on. But if you take him as part of the mission, he'll go in the active player's discard pile, and you'll have to wait to cycle him later. Okay, so either, okay, so it's not that he drives you to the mission and then goes for a smoke break and just watches you and goes, yeah, watch out for Zartan. Oh, that's too bad. It's instead the idea, I I suspect, he drives you to the mission and he says, have fun, and then drives back. So (laughs) you go pick up more Joes to do other stuff later. Yeah. Okay, okay. If he stays, then you get to use his buying power as well in in your purchase phase. Oh, he's he's known as a as a very good haggler, that Rodimus Prime. Just so. Apparently, I don't know why I picked Rodimus Prime. Nobody likes Rodimus Prime. He's the, the least favorite of the Transformers. I wouldn't go that far. <laughs> <laughs> but 
So it had this fantastic mission where Cobra Commander was riding in Starscream and, 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 and <laughs> it had hot. flavor text on it. It was, uh, it was all hot. fantastic. Okay, all, I might have to try this version. All very interesting things. You had uh, uh, Energon Cube dice and all sorts of fun stuff. Anyway, still enjoying G.I. Joe, the deck building game. Fun and useless fact. So Cobra is technically an acronym. I can't remember what it's an acronym for. And some sort of cold medicine, I'm sure. No. COBRA is also an acronym in the United States for a certain kind of healthcare coverage. It is specifically a form of transitional coverage after you get after you lose your job or you get fired or what have you. That's some sort of kick butt coverage. <laughs> COBRA. <laughs> Well, it's very threatening. <laughs> yeah. And I don't know why they opted for Cobra, because even if you're not familiar with G.I. Joe, I'm not assuming that the American legislature, when they, they formed this this act, decided to... But why... It's healthcare. Why name it after a venomous snake? I don't understand. Anyway, so as somebody who had to deal, uh, at least indirectly, with, with healthcare policy when working in the United States, people kept talking about Cobra benefits. I'm like, what? Have you retired from the insurgent organization that gave G.I. Joe a hard time, I thought they were made up. And they have benefits? I thought that the only benefit packet they had was that parachute that, that deployed after you got shot, your plane got shot down. Boo. Um, many expansions coming out. There's going to be a campaign expansion, Mark. You don't say. I do say. Because, <laughs> you know, every, every game needs one. Uh, you're right. It's true. <laughs> wow. That, this is a lot of support for it, a deck building it, it game. It is a lot of support. Yeah. That's like... Th three expansions, Cold Snap. Uh, three expansions already. The Venom one and the Transformers one. Yeah. There's this, uh, the campaign one, and then there's going to be one after that as well. Wow. Okay. That, that that's that's announced. Who knows? Who knows, Mark? <laughs> how deep this well will go? I don't know. Do you know? <sighs> Joe knows. <laughs> and knowing is half the battle. Just so. We got to try Anunnaki Dawn of the Gods, which was recently fulfilled in, here in Canada from the Kickstarter. This was designed by Simone Luciani and Danilo Sabia. Danilo Sabia and Simone Luciani are also the co-designers of Rats of Wistar. Yes. A big. title we're looking forward to, mostly yeah. because of our enthusiasm for Simone Luciani. And he's also coming out with Nucleum this year as well. He's yes. big titles coming out. Yeah, Simone Luciani is probably our favorite of the Italian masters, based in no small part through his participation with other designs with uh, Daniela Tashini as well as uh, Tommaso Battista, specifically Barrage. Uh, we're not huge fans of Cranio Creations as a publisher, though, although I will say in terms of materials, Anunnaki Dawn of the Gods seemed fine. I didn't really notice any serious problems. It wasn't the most attractive game in the world necessarily, but it wasn't. It didn't have the kind of flimsy cardboard and components that I associate with again other other of their publications, specifically Barrage. Now, Anunnaki: Dawn of the Gods is kind of sort of a weird Euro Forexy adjacent kind of thing. You have this action selection mechanism that I actually thought was borderline clever. Yeah, it's like a, a spider web of different actions you can take. So you're moving. You're pawing around the spider web and you're taking the actions and some of the connections will give you these mana crystals because you might say, hey, Mike, well, how? You, what if you want to take the, cra the action on the far side of the spider web? Don't worry. You can spend these mana crystals to do any action you want. So you're not sort of locked out of, you know, actions that are way on the other side of the board. So you're constantly sort of shifting around this spider web, filling in these these gaps. And I really want to give it another try. And the moment you surround a summoning token with cubes, in other words, you've moved your action pawn along all the paths surrounding a given summoning token, you may summon for free one of the of the appropriate gods. So there are five major you have sorry, you have four major gods you have access to as well as a major god, depending on which pantheon you're doing. And the theme of the game is that the gods are these aliens that possess the bodies of human followers and I don't know it's all very weird it's very disjointed because you have your own sort of little planet yeah and then there's a middle planet and then yeah it's it's, just... it, it's it's a little strange I, I I respect that they were trying to do something a little different and I'm not exactly sure about the titling of the game because Anunnaki refers specifically to Sumerian and Babylonian gods and they're one of the four factions in the base game so I don't really know what's going on there anyway suffice to say uh the Clever action selection mechanism is being used to drive some map action, which I find comparatively unsatisfying. It's okay, but it's a little stolid. It's not as dynamic or as interesting as I would have liked. And conflict is very much channeled in a sort of Euro direction where it's 
I find transactional in an unsatisfying way. So if you're going to be having fighting in a game, I want there to be a sense of risk. I want there to be a sense of tension. I want there to be a sense of daring maneuvers and interest, the likes of which you might see in a game like Senji, in a game like Kemet. Now, granted, those are two of my favorite Euro games with conflict involved, but suffice to say, I didn't find that the, the fighting and competition in Anunnaki was done in a particularly compelling way. Now, that having been said, as, as, I, as I mentioned, the action selection mechanism is interesting, and it's a sufficiently in-depth game that I'd want to try it again. The symmetry is also reasonably well done, so I might be interested in trying other factions. I don't know. I wasn't immediately wowed, but I'm, I'm kind of pleasantly intrigued. And we did play two players, so maybe it'll open up a little bit more with more players. And one, more hopes, sure. yeah, one, one hopes. One hopes. I mean, I'd, I'd like that. The, the key thing that I have a uh, difficulty with is that I was actually comparing it. This may seem like a reach, but I'll, I'll defend this. I actually find that it treads a lot of the same ground as Hyperborea, to be frank. Because Hyperborea similarly has an interesting action selection mechanism being used to drive a quasi 4 x civilization adjacent civilization adjacent thing where you're spreading across a map, potentially getting into dust-ups with other players and trying to exploit the various map features that you might encounter. But I found that the combos that you could exploit in Hyperborea were more interesting, the movement was more dynamic, the asymmetry evolved over the course of the game in a more organic way than, than I felt that it did in Anunnaki. And I felt that it all just sort of gelled together. And the emphasis that was put on the resources was very off-putting. Yeah, so in Anunnaki, resources come very dearly. You're always poor in something, and so you really have to work hard to get nearly anywhere. And every time you gather resources, you're basically uh, depleting areas of the map in a very, very, very aggressive way. Every time you gather any resources from any hex, you permanently lose one ability to gather resources. Now, you might think, well, but surely that's not a big deal if a hex can generate lots of resources. Well, most hexes generate one or two. And so that means you'll be gathering once or twice from there. And it worked out okay. Like, we were able to get enough. But no, just the way it dominated the whole game is what I mean. Like, you know, sure there was enough and everything, but it just seemed like such a huge part of the game was this constant, you know, getting resources and and making sure you had enough and the stress of, of, you know, losing it so quickly type thing. Yeah. Again, I, I think that falls into the category of it didn't come together in a very like tense and interesting way. As far as I was concerned, yeah. it, it felt more like a sort of grindingly attritional, sort of desperate scrabble to get just a couple of wood. And that's not as dynamic as interesting as as it could be, especially when you're talking about a game like Anunnaki, where the theming is about how you're manifesting your god's vision. And But at the end of the day, it's like, I desperately need to get one food. Where can I get one food? Oh, my goodness. So <laughs> the sort of tension of, of mana worked out fine, because that was, you know, dovetailed with the more interesting bits of the game, namely the action selection mechanism. And mana is, you know, gathering mana and exploiting mana seems more fitting, at least me thematically with Anunnaki. But again, it's like, I am I am the great gods of Egypt, and I desperately need a food. <laughs> you want to fight? Well, you got to first do this other action to get you a fancy attack card, because you can't attack the other players. And then you need to be able to pay for the fancy attack yeah. card sometimes. Yeah. It's... And then it's like a one time, and now, oh, you had your fight, and you want to fight someone else. Well, you're going to have to go get another fancy attack card. Yeah, yeah. And it also, it was strange in that, as the defender, it's one of those. It's one of those things. A lot of Euro games do this. In fact, this was the same problem with another mythologically themed game, Hybris. As the defender in these fights, it's almost never in your interest to put up a fight, and so you end up with m even more unsatisfying combat, right? Because in Anunnaki specifically, not getting to Hybris because Hybris is its own uh, kettle of fish. But in Anunnaki, you can only attack if you have an advanced weapon card, which you may use once, and then you need to buy it again with, again, some of these precious resources. So let's say that you're being attacked. Well, if you're the defender, you have access to these basic weapon cards, which can always come back to you. And if you're sitting there as the defender, you may think, well, okay, why would I bother putting up a serious fight? If I win, all I get to do is keep this possibly partially depleted hex. And then I've wasted one of my advanced we weapon cards just to hold on to the scrap of dirt that I've already got. Eh. So you end up with these weirdly anticlimactic fights where you probably, you're probably guaranteed to win, but you gotta play the advanced weapon card anyway. Yeah. Now, maybe with more players, maybe with more plays, that won't manifest. But as a first play, that was definitely my experience. But again, that having been said, 
I found the premise sufficiently interesting and the action selection mechanism in Anunnaki sufficiently interesting that I would give it another shot. I'm not exceptionally optimistic, and I also confess that my eagerness to play Rats of Wistar has gone down a, a bit uh, as a consequence of playing Anunnaki Dawn of the Gods. I have read the rules for Rats of Wistar. It has very promising stuff there. Oh, I'm a play. It's just it used to be one of my yes. most anticipated releases of the next few months, and now it's just gone to, oh, let me know when it comes in. Gotcha. That, that's the scale. Right? Imagine like a little thermostat that's filling up. Ah, I see. The bar, yeah, I see. Yeah, yeah. The bars are filled. There you go. And that's Anunnaki, Dawn of the Gods by Simone Luciani and Danilo Sabia, published this year by Cranio Creations. There's a whole bunch of expansions that I do not have because the game was already expensive. We got an actual physical copy of Sky Team. Sky Team is designed by Luc Ramond and put out by Le Scorpion Masquet. And what it is, is you are landing a plane. It is a cooperative <laughs> or game. Or not. <laughs> or not. One person is the pilot. The other person is the co-pilot. And you're discussing some strategies. And then you're rolling four dice each. And then you're not allowed to talk. And then you're placing these dice on the board. And you're putting them in certain orders and in certain places. And you want certain denominations. And you're trying to send each other clues by the order and by the number that you're putting out. And I'm wondering, Mark, we played it a bit on BGA. I'm wondering if those sort of... Uh, uh, trick-taking game type clues manifested for you in our plays of... Not yet. I think largely because we're not speaking the same language. I, I'm willing to attribute this just to just to my having different expectations than you in terms of how to communicate with dice. I will say that it was definitely easier to follow what was going on. And BGA playing asynchronously, it very much was the case where, you know, a few hours or maybe even a day goes between dice placements. You're like, what are we doing again? Oh, yeah. Every round I have to do the following two. Have I done those yet? Oh, I have. Okay, fine. And so just a breezy in-person 20-minute experience is absolutely the way to experience Sky Team. And in that context, it shines. I will say that thematically I find Sky Team bizarre because <laughs> you have this... <laughs> If you don't succeed in the mission, the plane crashes. The game is very clear about this. This isn't about a good landing versus a bad landing. This is about crashing the yeah. plane. Death for all or death for all, success. Or you you land the plane and then the rulebook specifically says if you do success successfully, the passengers burst out into spontaneous applause. Now, I haven't flown a whole heck of a lot, but I have been in commercial airliners before. And in my experience... If you land the plane and fail to kill everyone on board, rapturous applause is not the response. The response is, oh, I need to rush the aisle because I need to get access to my overhead compartment. Not, oh my goodness, it's a miracle we survived. What I'm saying is, is that they're not very optimistic in Sky Team about your odds of success. And I find it a little strange. That having been said, the game is a blast. I'm glad you enjoyed it. We played a very sort of beginner type uh, flights, and I'm looking forward to getting into the super advanced stuff. I do appreciate that the intro scenario is at uh, Trudeau Airport in Montreal. That's great. Or specifically Dorval, which is not really Montreal. True. We did play the slightly more advanced version, well, the next step up uh, in the form of Heathrow, where planes are just showing up all over the place. I Yeah, I enjoyed the elaborations. They're straightforward, and they make the game more difficult but nonetheless don't feel particularly cumbersome. Now, if we get to the point where we're managing mountains, airflow, fuel, uh, a whole bunch of other things, maybe I might change my tune. But as it is, it remains a very... Sky Team is, is a great 20-minute two-player experience. Yeah, and not hard to teach. I definitely recommend it. That is Sky Team, put out by the Scorpion Masque. Walker was very kind after repeated requests to show me Messina 1347. This is by Raul Fernandez Aparicio and Vladimir Suki, published by Delicious Games. I had been under the misapprehension that this was Walker's favorite Suki. I was wrong. I was also under the impression, I, there was just a whole bunch of false impressions, it's almost like I don't listen to Walker when he talks, that Messina 1347 was also markedly more straightforward and simple than other Suki games. This is not true. This was made abundantly clear to me just after the setup, where it was very much like pretty much every other Vladimir Suki game, which is to say, usually about five to six different piles of different kinds of tiles that need to be sorted and shuffled and what have you. This is not particularly out of the ordinary for your average Euro game. I mean, frankly, if it's if it's a medium weight Euro game, odds are excellent you're going to be doing a lot of this stuff, unless the designer happens to be Reiner Knizia, in which case it's probably not a medium weight Euro game anyway, or if it wasn't 
uh, published, uh, you know, 20, 15 to 20 years ago. If it's been published in the past five years and it's a medium weight Euro game, odds are excellent that you're going to be dealing with a lot of the stuff. And if Sookie's name is on the front of the box, doubly so. So my misapprehension is thus shattered. We then proceeded to play what I would absolutely call another Vladimir Sookie game. So there's some in- vaguely interesting thematic stuff about burning out plague in Messina. Well, I think when it comes to board games, I think this is very heavily themed, in my opinion. You are going into areas of the town where there is, if there is plague there, you are saving the people, you're sending them out to the countryside to quarantine to them. To work your sick houses. Uh, well, 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 there is talk <laughs> that there might be some work to do. But you see, these cabins don't build themselves, Mark. All right? And this healthcare ain't free. All that I know is that you can show up in a district, find a sick nun who's, uh, you know, covered in buboes, and be like, don't worry, I'll take care of you, sister. Here, go make me some Nikes out in this back lot. <laughs> and save her life. Yeah, this notion of s- saving, it's... um. Mm. Now, the only thing that is completely Euroy or unthematic is that you have yet another spider webby type area on your player board where you're moving the nuns and the craftsmen and the nobles around and they're sort of giving you bonuses as you're as you're playing the game. Right, because if you don't send them to work making Birkin bags out in the vomitorium, you instead have them on your main board, which represents who knows what spatio-temporally, yeah. and they get triggered based on moving some marker. I would actually say that the least thematic element, because at least there you're cashing in favors from people whose lives you've saved. The least thematic element to me, and which was definitely a hint and a half that I wasn't going to find this tremendously engaging, is the fact that there are three different tracks that you advance up through three different mechanisms, don't really amount to much of anything in terms of any sense making, and give you different benefits. They are not the trackiest of tracks, but they are pretty heavily tracky. It's true. They're not, they're not at least the whole point of the game. At least in Messina 1347, you're not going to be getting the overwhelming preponderance of your points for these tracks, but you're going to be getting a lot of points through those tracks if you, if you race up them. The personal scoring conditions are also arguably tracks, but they're at least I'll give them a pass because there's just one way to go up those, those, those markers and they serve as a multiplier to a variety of other things you might be inclined to do, which for what it's worth, is also how the tracks work in Anunnaki Dawn of the Gods. Those tracks I object to less. But I'd have to say that Messina 1347 on a not tracky to tracky scale was pretty tracky. Very tracky. It's definitely gone off the tracky track. It does have a little bit of interesting worker placement. You have your, your lieutenants out on the board, and they once you put them on the board, they stay on the board. So you have to try to spread them out. And there is a little bit of interesting play there because, you know, they're all lying down, and then you move them one space for free or spend some money to move them further. And you want to, you know, try to keep them spaced out and sort of block people from places. And there's boats and all sorts of interesting stuff, things going on. I probably would have found that more interesting. And I agree with you that conceptually it is pretty good as far as worker placement goes. But in the game that we played, I was drowning in money. And as a consequence, it was always incredibly trivial for me to get my workers where I needed to go. And it got to the point where granted, this is a form of player interaction where I'd look at all my workers, figure out what I broadly what I would like to get done in the round, look to my left, look to my right, saw that you didn't have any money, saw that Huey didn't have any money, and realized, oh, y'all ain't moving anywhere. I don't have to worry. There's no tension. I can do whatever I want. <laughs> and so it became uh, very, very liberating in that sense. Uh, but again, that was purely an artifact of the case that I just happened to be with an excess of cash. I, I, I grant you that the worker placement was potentially kind of cool. It was also the case that you had the option in Messina 1347 to get additional workers, and that was not the dominant strategy. And I I approve of that wherever possible. That's a common critique I have of a lot of worker placement games. If you can't get more workers, you you must, or you will not be competitive. And I felt that Messina did a pretty good job of balancing that. The thing I enjoyed about it is that after they work in your quarantine cabins you put them to work in your network and then after that you send them out to the workshops to work and then (laughs) when they're just too tired to work then then you throw them on a wagon and you ship them back home and you get big points for that i think that is hilarious you're done making the, the, the the running shoes you're done making the knockoff birkins you then go and you work in my sweatshop and then when you're done doing that I get to go send you out to the quote unquote farm upstate where we pile you up in a wagon like cordwood and they never get heard from again. The, the, the 
for sure plague-free housing. Yeah, this is... I'm starting to think that Mesita is actually a game about torturing nuns. I mean, did did Raul Fernandez Aparicio and Vladimir Suki just have a bad experience at some sort of upbringing? Yeah, we'll, I, have to, we'll have to look into this a little bit more. Yeah, anyway. So, look, it was fine. I, I, I don't think... Uh, in terms of the recent Suckies, I would rather play Praga Caput Regni, personally. And in terms of my all-time Suckies, it doesn't even rank. Uh, they've reissued Shipyard, which was one of Vladimir Suckies' first games, and is definitely a game of rondels. There's the rondel you go around to determine which rondel you go around again. There's Sweet. rondels upon rondels. I enjoyed Shipyard for my first couple playings, but felt that it needed some polish. Uh, and if the polish has been delivered, I'm actually looking forward to the new one. And, of course, there's our favorite Sookie, which is Pulsar 2849. At any rate, uh, Messina was okay. Uh, it didn't really grab me. And that is Messina 1347 by Delicious Games. And those are the games we played this week. Now a brief break while we pay some bills. This week's episode is brought to you by HelloFresh, America's number one meal kit. With HelloFresh, you get farm-fresh, pre-portioned ingredients and seasonal recipes delivered right to your doorstep. Fall is my favorite season, but let us speak truth to power and proclaim that seasonality goes way beyond pumpkin-spiced everything. And with the chef-crafted recipes from HelloFresh, you'll get all the flavors of fall direct from the farm for peak ripeness that you can taste. Cooked in less time than it takes to get delivery. Between family, two jobs, reading rules, and playing games, you tend to fall into the same meals over and over again. Well, not with HelloFresh. And with 40 exciting recipes every week, HelloFresh has you covered. You can save money, save time, get to enjoy cooking, and eat better than some frowning lordly dude you need to impress, all with HelloFresh. Go to HelloFresh.com slash 50SoWrongGames and use code 50SoWrongGames for 50% off, plus free shipping. That's HelloFresh.com slash 50SoWrongGames, code 50SoWrongGames for half off, plus free shipping. And we're back! And now back for the news and why it doesn't matter. The next game for the Valiant Defense series has been kind of sort of announced or at least publicly discussed. The Valiant Defense series is the series of solo war games published by DVG Games designed by David Thompson, a perennial uh, favorite designer of this show. It has seen some incredible games like Soldiers and Postman's Uniforms and Pavlo's House, as well as many others. The most recent one had graphic design by Niels Johansson and I th- Lanzarath Ridge, and I think really brought a visual flair to the series, and it was very much appreciated. Niels Johansson will be doing the graphic design for the next release as well, which will be Guadalcanal, which is one of those conflicts that a lot of World War II buffs, especially American ones, seem to think is super important and interesting, and I've never really cared about. But... I care about it a lot more now, so <laughs> I'm looking forward to the next release in the Valiant Defense series. So we love waiting for crowdfunding stuff, right, Mark? <laughs> and what's, Do we? what's better than waiting for crowdfunding is that you, when you're on your local Facebook and you say, for sale, pallets of the game that you're waiting for to show up. <laughs> Doesn't that fill you full of full of joy and and? So yeah, is... it's like it's like waiting for Godot, but instead of waiting for Godot, you've paid Godot forty six American dollars for shipping, and then he shows up, he kicks you in the beanbag, and leaves. So unfortunately, this is what happened to Tiny Epic. They had Tiny Epic Crimes, and then in one area that it was being shipped to, a, a big Facebook sort of ad came up and said, "Now selling pallets of of unopened board games." Really. Of, of Tiny Epic Crimes. Then, of Tiny Epic Crimes? Yes, of the, of the one that was fulfilling. Wow. And, and so they double-checked with their with their fulfillment, and the fulfillment place said, oh, no, we made a mistake. We, we can't find find your pallets. Wow. So it sounds as though it's all been fixed, but kind of funny news. <laughs> <laughs> Finally for us, this is an episode that is a multiple of five, which means it is time to acknowledge that we have a Patreon. If you like what we do and wish to support independent board game media, please do go support us on Patreon. You get ad-free episodes. You get bonus episodes. There's going to be two bonus episodes this week, Walker. Two bonus episodes this week. Higher pledge levels. You can also get free games. And everyone gets access to our Patreon-exclusive Discord. And uh, people get to tell us what to do. Tons of stuff. Tons of stuff. Tons Tons of of content. Hours and hours and hours and hours and hours of bonus content. Please support us on Patreon if you like what we do. And that is the news and why it doesn't matter. Now onto the topic of the week, which is updating the canon. First of all, Walker, why don't you spend a a couple minutes uh, talking about what you conceive of the canon to be? That's true. I I was I went over the canon mm-hmm. and I was like, who the hell wrote this? <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. No, no, that, that I was that's kind of semi silly. I think the canon should be games 
that like a sort of wide variety of different sure. games and, and a bunch of different genres that we feel exemplifies the best of that particular area. Ooh, okay, okay, that's fair. I don't know if I necessarily conceive it in those terms. Uh, we we phrase it in the in in the way we do largely because uh, Walker sometimes gets a little shirty when it comes to topics such as uh, top end lists or recommendations, uh, but uh, it is the way that it is. Uh, I conceive of the canon. First of all, I called it the canon. This I will freely cop to this. This is exclusively to troll Walker. Uh, part la not okay, not exclusively. Eighty five percent to troll Walker because he does not like the word canon. Uh, the other 15% was mostly out of uh, self-referential mockery to people who drone on and on about the Western canon or the canon of Western, you know, whatever. And uh, often this is a bunch of uh, culturally insensitive gatekeeper nonsense, and I just wanted to poke fun at that. It, it's not really like our ideal game collection or what have you. I would phrase it as a list of games that we both very, very much enjoy. True. The, the way I look, the way I took it for this particular list was because we play so many new games, what games have we specifically gone back to? Yeah. To play over and over again, not just once, yep. but multiple times because we enjoy them so much. That is an excellent point. I think, but I think that that is an excellent way of, of uh, recharacterizing and recapitulating what, uh, what we've already said, but I think it's already uh, already good criterion. It is a way to you know put something in in the in the firmament, even amidst the churn, would be a less clear and uh, less articulate way to put it. So, with that in mind, uh, I would like to start with ones on the list that we might want to consider removing. Is that a, is yeah? That a good place I, to start? I I also have ones on the list as well. Some okay. of them are just clean up. Sure, absolutely. And some of them I I think that should be just taken off. Sock it to me, Walker. Ethnos, believe it or not, I went back and forth to it a couple mm-hmm. times. Yeah, and I just think it, it's it's time to pull that off of there. Okay, why? Well, well we had Archeo Society now, and we played both, and it was just sort of like, yeah, this is this is all right. <laughs> it lost a little bit of its shine, I think, in the last few plays. More useful in terms of its flexibility than perennially must have. Just so. Fair enough. Fair enough. I was I had it here listed under versions because sometimes a new version makes you want to reconsider. I was uh, curious whether you would want to supplement Ethnos with Archeo Society, but you would feel more comfortable just taking it off. I think so. That seems reasonable. I mean, look. To be fair. Either one of us has a as an absolute veto. If either one of us wants it off the list, it's off the list. This is like there are lots of games that I would add, and in fact, I'll I'll talk about them briefly later that I think belong there. But Walker either hasn't played or hasn't played enough or doesn't like. So yeah, yeah I, and yeah. I'm not I'm not gonna fight you for I'm not taking pulling, off I'm not cross. taking like Ethnos is bad or anything. Oh I'm yeah, just, of course, I'm just, I'm of course. I'm not saying it's yep. it's yes, absolutely reasonable, absolutely reasonable. So Ethnos will be taken off the list. What else, Walker? I don't think we need Guards of Atlantis and Guards of Atlantis 2. I could not agree more. <laughs> so we'll just keep Guards of Atlantis 2 there, and we'll take Guards of Atlantis 1. I don't know up. why we left it the previous... I think this was just that what happens is Warm Boy is our webmaster. He's a master of many things, but he's also a master of webs. Whether he is a master of warmth, I don't know. And I, I think I just told him to add Guards of Atlantis 2, and I might not have specified that he should have rem- that he just should have put the 2 at the end of Guards of Atlantis. <laughs> I think uh, the crew should be updated to uh, the water. <laughs> Mission Deep Sea. Deep, Mission Deep Sea. Yes, I was, Planet that was also another one under versions that I was going to ask you about. Yes, we have. I see we have uh, thought exactly the same. Those were the three things I had in terms of versions. Ethnos versus Archeo Society, First Guards, and the crew, whether we wanted to update the, that to Mission Deep Sea. And again, this is not because we don't think that the crew is an absolutely fabulous game. It's just that yes. there ain't, ain't really any reason to have both of them. And of the two, we prefer Mission Deep Sea. And, and talking about things that we prefer, when playing Pandemic, we really do prefer Fall of Rome. Yes. There is no doubt about Fall of Rome is the best of the Pandemic, uh, pandemic I, games. I don't agree. But I, st- I still don't think it, it is. it needs to be on this list. Oh. Hmm. Oh. Okay. That makes me sad. Uh, I'm not trying to say that I have the, the, the full yeah, on veto. I've, well, I've, the, the, the no, no, you do, you do. It's 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 fair. I I think it's clear that I have much more enthusiasm for pandemic than you do. And my conception was this was the pandemic that we agreed on the most. But if that doesn't reach 
the threshold of enthusiasm for you, then absolutely take it off the list. That's fine. I mean, my favorite pandemic is still base pandemic with on the brink. Uh, with uh, I, I really like Fall of Rome. I think it's it's my favorite of the pandemic variants of the historical scenarios. But uh, all right, so long, Fall of Rome. This one should be moved to the debate class. I have a debate. Okay. I have a debate section. Too. Absolutely, so do I. So that's all I have for the remove. Oh, I have some questions though about. Uh, I, I have some. I have some possible removes. Sure. For us, uh, this one is not for me, but I'm asking on behalf of you. This is specifically referring to a comment you made a couple of weeks ago. Are you still comfortable with a feast for Odin being on the list? Oh, for sure. Oh, okay. Because you you had talked about how you know it really your last playing really emphasized how unpleasantly heads down it was. As I said, but it's so sure so okay. high. Yeah, okay, okay, okay. Um, I think I want Concordia off the list. All right. I think it's just. I mean, it just it really fails to put it in. I'm not going to endorse the full Marie Kondo, right? But when I think of Concordia, when Concordia is proposed to me, when I even on the season list, I'm like, yeah, it's all right. And so I, I think this was me succumbing to peer pressure because it is. It not only is it the Matt Gertz that everyone loves; it is so well loved in the hobby. But I am not there with everyone else. Well, there's a couple games. I have one in the debate section. Okay, that follows the same sort of. Uh, uh, game mechanic as Concordia. Uh-huh. And if it comes down to it, I'd rather play Flot- Flotilla any time instead of Concordia. So but that is not on the list. That is anyway. not on the list. Yeah, okay. Fair enough. I don't know, though, and this is this is an open question. For some things, we might be inclined to say we don't need more than one kind of X. I don't know if hand management, which is the term we used for that kind of... Uh, sorry, hand building, rather. Uh, where you, it's the combination of hand management and deck building, where, you know, your deck is your hand and you play one card and get all your hand, your cards back, a la Aquatica, a la Flotilla, a la, um, Concordia. Uh, yeah. So I, I don't know, especially since that's a way to drive actions, not so much as a mechanism in and of itself. Uh, like I, for example, although I'm comfortable putting Concordia in the same bucket as all those games, as well as in Fayum, I don't know that they serve the same kind of duplication as say, I don't know off the top of my head, like co-op trick taking games, right? Gotcha. If there was another co-op trick taking game that we both really liked, I think I might be comfortable hypothetically. I don't know for sure. Well, we've already got the crew. Do we need another cooperative trick taking game? I don't know that I'd say the same in terms of duplication with respect to say Flotilla and Fayum, just True. off the top of my head. All right, so Concordia is getting off the list. All right. And the last one, I'm not sure about this. Um, fairy tale. It is still the best at hate dra- Oh, okay, okay, definitely. Walker's giving me the, the scary eye. We don't play it. It's true. And part of me wonder is so because part of, part of the problem with fairy tale is uh the it is the best at hate drafting. It is the best drafting game that we've played in terms of hate drafting. But the scoring elements uh, don't satisfy me as much. And part of it is it's harder to explain than a lot of other drafting games, including, for example, It's a Wonderful World. 100%. And I don't know if I want to, if It's a Wonderful World on the list. I'm in a state of confusion. Talk me into Fairy Tale Walker. I, it is just fantastic. <laughs> I don't know what to say. I, I, it, it is true that we have not pushed to have it out because the teach is a lot more difficult than, than, more recent yeah. card games of that ilk. All right, tell you what. Uh, so we'll... no, I, I'd, I'd have to say, I'd have to agree, because we have not, it has not been played. I, I don't but, know. But if I'm I... keeping my copy. You, no, can't, you... you can't make me get I'm rid of it. I'm not trying to make you get rid of it. <laughs> and I don't know that we haven't played it in the past couple of years is necessarily a good no, reason no. to yank it, right? No, I, I'm not saying that it's the only reason, but it, it, is, it is something that has happened. Tell you what. Yeah. Let's, uh... We can we can always put games back on. I, I was just about to say, Mark, this is this isn't you know the the right. close the door list. All right, so 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 fairy tale for now is on the chopping block, and oh, I don't feel great about it. No, but here we are. Okay, so those were the only ones that I had on my uh, uh, on my list of games to remove. Uh, but you have some uh, debates. So yeah. let, so let's... I have an I have an ad list which I think I put on here. I don't think there, you might debate some of them but sure but uh let's well, see it, the ones that i have green let's go to the debate ones debate ones yeah green team wins yeah i don't know i've got that on my debate list as well uh i'm not sure let, let let's let's talk about it so party games we already have a bunch of word party games right we've got code names we've got just one 
And parenthetically, for anyone who's, who's curious, this is on our website, just to stress. So this is not some sort of secret list that we've hidden. No. <laughs> and if you're curious to follow along, uh, I'll try to make reference to, to games that are already there. Um, and we have Tapple here too. So is Tapple? So uh, yeah, would, ta- it be, would it be a Tapple versus Green Team? Like, is it going to be one or the other, or is it going to be both? It's or? weird. Like, so Tapple, to my mind, it kind of verges into how many party word games do we need, right? And so I would, if anything, I'd be inclined to uh, say that if we're going to put Tapple on, we might consider taking off just one. Uh, like, like So Clover also vaguely came to mind, but it's like at that point we're really gilding the lily. I prefer just one to So Clover. Uh, uh, there's only so many word party games that I'm inclined to to in, to include. Uh, I don't know. What, what are your thoughts? My thoughts would be that green team win goes in. Okay. Yeah, we don't have a lot of other like social dynamic party games, and I think the green team wins does a a, a pretty good job of that. And it always hits. Like I have yet to have. It <sighs> That's done. true. You're right. It, it it doesn't fail. It always and it always generates good conversation. There's yeah. always usually one or two questions where everyone's like, "Ooh," and then we want to talk about it afterwards. You're right. Green team wins on the list. Of course, we're talking about the hobby version that goes up to twelve players. Of course, not the decrepit version that I got stuck with. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cryo. <sighs> That's an interesting question. I I don't think so. I really like Cryo. Want to play it again? I don't think it quite gets there. All right. In the game I was talking about, Concordia, I do have Aquatica on this list. That is also a good question. Because, once again, it's a game that we constantly go back to. I think largely by virtue of, I don't know, there's a lot to recommend it. But by the same token, I think one of the reasons why we go back to to Aquatica is one of the same reasons that I go back to It's a Wonderful World. It's flexible in terms of player count. It is approachable in terms of rules load, and when Game Daddy, that's me, referring to myself in the third person, in a somewhat creepy way, when Game Daddy wants a little break, sometimes Game Daddy brings something he knows that the table will be able to will be able to process. And that's kind of the same category that Ethnos is in, right? I'll happily play any of these games, but I don't know if I'd put Aquatica to the same level. But again, I'm open to, I'm open to be uh, convinced. No, I, like I said, it's up there. I... There's not much of a fight for it. It's just the fact, like I said, we, it's a game that we returned to multiple times. That was the one and only reason. Sure. Did we want to put tender, tender blocks in instead of... Uh, junk art? Junk art. I would say no. All right. Do you disagree? No. No, like I said, these are just things I just wanted to... Yeah, junk art for me still wins in terms of the cleverness of the different pieces how even after several plays, you're discovering new nuances about how the pieces interact with each other. And the fact that you have so many different game modes and scoring elements that can be tailored to your liking. You don't like real-time games? Don't play with any of the real-time versions. You don't like versions that are that are competitive or you're trying to make your opponent's structure falls? Get rid of those, too. There's tons of different ways to play. And, and I, you can just make up ways, too. And you can just make up ways, too. My constant complaint about a lot of dexterity games is that they don't have good victory conditions, and Junk Art is one of the few where the different game modes compensate for that really well. Uh, but since we're talking about dexterity games, would you mind if I brought up some other possibilities? Sure. So, the, again, spitballing here, I was thinking about uh, Crash Octopus, Yuri Yura Penguin, and For Science. I don't know if we want any of those in. Oh, For Science, for sure. I don't know why I didn't. Yeah, okay. That seems that seems good to me. For Science is really so good. And then, and then unfortunately, you know, Yuri Yuri is fantastic in all its forms, but the actual game part of it. Is, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Is true. So weak. What about Crash? Or am I thinking about Crash Octopus exclusively in terms of the house rule that I put in it, where, that, where, that I feel fixes some of the trickiness? Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, fair enough. No Crash Octopus, but for science, yes, yes, yes. Uh, if, if for no other reason than it brings together so many interesting elements, it's a little rules heavy for a fifteen minute fun, uh, uh, you know, large player count game. But nonetheless, it allows people to focus on what it is they want to do, and there's madcap fun to be had. For science gets onto the swag cannon. That's not a hat. I don't know. I thought about that's not a hat. That's an right. interesting question. I don't. More plays, maybe. More plays. I, I, I think, I think it's on the bubble. I think that's not a hat is on the bubble. We've only played it a small number of times. Uh, I don't know. I would want to see how well it does 
with people outside our core group. I want to see how it fares with 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 people more in the broader wild if the tension drives them nuts. Because I think that might be illuminating, frankly. And shards of affinity are not is not on. There's two card games. I guess I do. I just thought now when I said shards shards of infinity out loud, I realized that Sentinels of the Multiverse. I don't remember seeing it on the list either. Yeah, I don't think Sentinels belongs there. Right. I, I can't. I, I my enthusiasm for Sentinels is the kind of thing that I don't feel I can I can defend. It's like a guilty pleasure. Gotcha. I don't know if I want that in 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 the canon necessarily. Yeah. Not that I'd be embarrassed. It's just that I don't know that I can really. Uh, it's one of those things that you're either going to get it or you're not. And I completely don't blame people who don't get it. It's like, this is stupid. You're right. It is kind of stupid. But in terms of card games or more specifically deck builders, there is a paucity of deck builders. And there are a couple that we really like, uh, that aren't there that we might want to consider. The th- one of them being Shards of Infinity, which is probably our favorite quick deck builder. There's Quest for Eldorado which does a brilliant job of making deck building a driver for a great race game. And then there's probably one of our favorite co-ops in the form of Xenoshift Onslaught, which is not very popular, but nonetheless is one we like. Now, granted, the the fragility of player count is a concern. Yes. So that that's a reason for you not to... Yeah, fair I, enough, fair enough. And that, I think that's very a uh, just you and I thing. <laughs> <laughs> sure, but I think, look... It can be a very you and I thing. Like the reason true, why I said true. with respect it, to that's it, not a hat is I want to see how other people react yeah. is not so much because I want the imprimatur of other people's acceptance, just in terms of I I don't know if it's the kind of thing where it's it's I'm appreciating the pure agony. <laughs> uh so I, I need more time to sit on it and other people's reactions can help me sit on the kinds of experiences that it engenders at the table. So fine. No Xeno Shift. Uh what do you say about uh Eldorado and or because we don't really have any deck builders there. We've got Mage Knight, which neither of us is considering removing at all, despite the fact that we haven't played it in a long time. And that's pretty much it as far as deck builders go. And Mage Knight was going to be my choice for the the today, but I decided to go with uh, Game of Thrones instead. Fair enough. No, I think Sarge Infinity and Eldorado, I think both. Both? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I can be sold for that. And then the rest, after ta- after what we've said so far, I don't, will not. I'd keep the heroes out, switch and signal, and it's a wonderful world, but no, I think. The only one always. I could per- be persuaded by uh, from that list is it's a wonderful world. Switch and signal is, 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 is very nice, as is keep the heroes out. They were just, they were just throwing on there as, sure. I, I was looking for a co- cooperative games. Right? Oh, okay. And I was like, okay. okay, well, what cooperative games have we gone back to multiple times? And I just threw them on there. Not so much that I wanted them on the list. It was just sort of... Sure. And again, I I, I just want to repeat something that you already said. Uh, the mere fact that anything is being mentioned in the context of this discussion means that it's a game that is real good. Yes. So, yeah. Uh, on that topic, uh, I've got a couple that uh, I'm actually surprised that you haven't mentioned yet. Uh, one of them is Oak. Oak is not on the list. Well, it's in my automatic ad list. Oh, automa- oh I'm sorry. Am I jumping the gun? Nope. Have I, have I, have I been precipitous? Yeah, okay. I, I, I agree. I think Oak absolutely needs to be there. Uh, another recent game, Revive, I think belongs there as well. Yes. Okay. No argument there. No. These are both games that we... Uh, Oak was very, very high on both of our best of year lists from last year. And I think Revive will be as well this year. It won the IGA. We're on the jury. I definitely voted for it. Uh, oh, wait, maybe that's supposed to be confidential. I don't know. Anyway. <laughs> uh, what else from the definite ad list you got there, Walker? Don't llama dice. Yeah, I, I, I don't. I think this is I think this is one of those things that's very idiosyncratic, but belongs on the list. Yes. Given the amount of fun stories and reactions that we get out of don't llama dice, I think it belongs there. Uh, I it is just past guilty pleasure for me. Yeah. It's 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 just I don't know why I love it as much as I do, but I absolutely do. I think is is what Don't Lama Dice is. And I think we just put like one word, just put undaunted on the list. Yeah, I was surprised that there's no undaunted there, and yeah. I and I don't know which one I'd pick honestly. Well, so I, just, I, I yeah, it's, I would just say un- fair enough. You're yeah. right. We don't have to specify just any any old undaunted. We've already got uh, soldiers and postmen's uniforms, which I think is probably I prefer Pavlov's house mechanically, but soldiers and postmen's uniform is just so interesting uh, from a historical perspective. I think it is the Valiant Defense series game that I would uh, that that I would definitely most easily recommend. 
Uh, there's another game that, that uh, I, I I don't know how much. Sometimes I wonder how much you enth- how much enthusiasm you have. El Grande isn't there. Yeah, I, it is now. I have it under. under El Grande uh, gets onto yeah, the cannon. Sure. On the well, I skipped one in the in the debate part. Oh, okay. We don't have Agricola on the. Yeah, so I, I I was rather surprised as well. I think because when we were first formulating the uh, the list, uh, you were uh, still in your Caverna Ye Agricola Boo phase. True. Uh, which I believe has evolved. Yes, very uh, much so. So yeah, I, I would happily put Agricola on the list. All right. What else from the uh, instant ad as far as you're concerned? Uh, NAR? Yep, absolutely. NAR is on the canon. Recent game that we reviewed. Really, really well done. One of the best fillers of the past few years. You all already said no to So Clover. I had that there. I, do Do you prefer So Clover over just one or code names? Yes. Really? Oh yes. Hmm. Both. Both. Really? Yeah, I really like So Clover. I enjoy So Clover, but I find but that that's a very much a me personal thing. If If I were to go to like a party situation uh-huh. or you know new people or anything like that, I would definitely take one of the other two. Yeah, I, I prefer. Uh, first of all, I prefer the pacing of both of those games over So Clover. I think the pacing of So Clover is very, very leaden in that everyone just put, does their, their clue, their clues head down and then you go and do the boards one at a time. Yeah. Uh, and also, I also, I, I also find just the random card for So Clover really determinative. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I don't say it. It was just, yeah. You know. Sure. Yeah. I, I prefer I both just one and, and are, are, are I mean, are you comfortable keeping both Just One and Codenames on the list? Yeah. If so, Clover can't? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. What do you think about Autobahn? Yeah, I was expecting you to bring Autobahn up. I am comfortable with putting on the list. I think it is one of the best Euros of the past few years. I wouldn't rate it as highly as Oak, and indeed I didn't in our end of your list. But I think that it is vastly better than a lot of other things that have been going out lately, and I would happily play it any day of the week, which is seldom the case for a lot of these also-rans. So, yeah. I don't mean also-rans that we were discussing today. I mean, of its weight class and and general structure. Just that little taste of historicity, just the the mechanics come together just well enough. Yeah, yeah. Autobahn's great. I've got a a, a quirky one to uh, to suggest. I'm curious because I don't really know your, your thoughts. What about Albedo? I saw that. I was looking at it today, and I'm wondering if because of its availability that we shouldn't put it on the cannon. Really? Because we've got a fair number. We haven't. I, I will point out, there's not a reason to, to dispute your characterization. Uh, we do have a number of out-of-print games here on the cannon. Uh, and in some of the elements of the cannon, we do actually recommend editions that are heavily out-of-print. <laughs> then... then- for sure. And I, I was definitely going to put it on the list. But none of them are... Uh, but I will say this. Even the ones that are heavily out of print, like, I mean, Senji's been out of print for over 15 years. Uh, it was put out by a major publisher and was never as obscure as Albedo is. Albedo is what we would call out of print and heavily obscure. And I am perfectly comfortable if you think that that combination is reason enough to keep it off the list. No. I think people... I think it's a semi-available. <laughs> And if it more, exists the, 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 in the world. The more people know about it, the better. That, yeah, because I, I think that's that's sort of a, uh, a, a a good justification for actually pushing it on the list, just so that people might encounter it. And even you know the jaded gamers who uh, think they've seen everything, they're like, oh, I've never heard of Albedo or what have you, and that may be a reason for uh, for people to consider it. What else you got, Walker? I only have one more. Okay, what's that? I might have forgotten. Hundreds, but this is the yep. list that I have for today. Sure. What do you think of Wonderland's War? I thought you would suggest it. I'm not sure I'm there. Yeah, I don't know if the pacing is right. It's a little over long. The pacing yeah. isn't there. It's it's uh, the the counterintuitiveness. And again, this is not about approachability. This is just about my my appreciation of it as as a design. The weird interaction between busting and uh, going mad. Yeah. Uh, or rather, the the lack of interaction and how people I people sorry. I get confused about the difference of the two, and that kind of undermines my experience. Great game. Happy to play. Don't think it gets there. Gotcha. Personally. I have another... Okay, so here are some things that I'm suggesting that I think you're going to say no to, but I am nonetheless uh, wish to raise. Uh, civilization. <laughs> 
I can see it on your face. The answer's a no. I, I wouldn't say that. I enjoy all of our planes of civilization. Yeah, but again, that I've enjoyed all my planes of Wonderland's War, right? I've enjoyed all my planes of So Clover. I don't think it holds the same place in your enthusiasm as it does in mine, and I would be surprised if it equals the level of enthusiasm. Let me put it this way. I would bet that your enthusiasm for civilization hovers roughly around my enthusiasm for Wonderland's War. Probably. Right. And so given that level of asymmetry, I think that, you know, to be consistent, we, we probably... Look, this isn't about the list of the most s- seminal or influential games of the past hundred years, right? Right. It's it's the things that we want to keep going back to, the things that spark joy in us, the, the ones that we want to recommend and point out. Yeah. Uh, I'm curious if Pulsar 2849 makes the list. Oh, it does, for sure. Yeah, I, I'm ha- I'd am i be happy to put it there. I think it, it, it deserves that. And point of fact, I think we should uh, we should play it again soon. Uh, uh, that reminds me, too, of... Uh, it's not Quasar. What's the, the dice? Your your spaceships are dice. Quantum. Quantum. That was also something I was, I was yeah, considering. That's got to be down there. All right. Quantum, quantum makes it as well. We're not adding too too many. This is this is this this so far is fine. Then there's a couple of uh, a couple of recent ones that are maybe a little bubbly, maybe mosaic. I don't know. I'm I'm not sure. I I'd, I'd like to like we both really like it. Yeah. Is it is it is uh, it more plays? More plays. Yeah. Okay. So mosaic is is keep an eye on on the bubble. I think the same thing applies to uh, Gods of Dinosaurs. I got it back. I got it back. Oh, we we, should, I saw it. I saw it in the should, pile. I didn't play, I didn't realize we lost it. We had lost it for a while, but uh, I got it back. Okay. Um, a number, a number of near misses, I think, for me. Uh, Stroganov is almost there, but not quite. Yeah. Really good. Happy really to good. play. Imperium the Contention, I think, a little too weird, a little too wonky. Fun things always happening, but you know, not as solid a game as say Quantum, for example. Yes, and like player count issues. Really? What player can it, to what player count issues? Uh, am I thinking about the wrong thing? I'm thinking about the spaceship games with cards. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just like the ganging up on, you know. Oh, sure. You know what okay. I mean? Like the fair enough. A versus B with eh, the C sometimes, and having yeah, to really sometimes, know. Sometimes. You really need to sort of know what the score is all the time because you might be helping someone win. That sure. You know, yeah. Sure. Uh, I think Jenga Maker is too soon. Too soon. But I'm very much enthusiastic about it. Aristea not quite high enough, I think. See, it's funny because both of those games I, I I had thought of. Yeah, I mean. <laughs> Aristea is wonderful. I I think you might need a, a um, it, it it's hard it's hard to remember to bring it in the rotation. Two player games are rough. It's it's weird. I don't know. Aristea, so I, I'm kind of on the fence. It's true. Uh, Oath Sworn, close but not quite. I think. Yeah. Really, really good in a lot of ways. Uh, what what would you think about the mirroring of Mary King? I'd have to play it a lot more. Okay. I played it twice. Oh really? Oh, I yeah. thought I thought you played it more than that. For me, I'd put it on, but yeah, if you've only played it twice. Oh, okay. Cosmic Frog is there though. Yeah, Cosmic Frog is there. Okay. Yeah, we've played Cosmic Frog a lot yeah. more than twice though. Uh, the Great Wall, I think, is close but not quite there. Oh, you might disagree. No, no, I just, that, as soon as you said it, but no, no, it's definitely it is it's definitely very clunky. But yes, it's definitely close. Mm. I don't know. So let let's talk it through. You, so you say clunky. What do you mean by clunky? It's uh, the the teach is huge. I love how it's much, much different than anything else that's out there. Mm-hmm. I love the fact that it's you can play it in different ways, cooperatively or Oh, yeah, but the co-op version is, 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 was, was not enjoyed. It was not, it was not good. We did not like it. No. <laughs> oh, the Great Wall. <laughs> You know, I mean, again, I think, I think I, I, I might, you might have talked me into including it for much of the same reason as Autobahn. In there are dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of mediocre resource management euros that get released every year. That's right. But the Great Wall is uh, there's enough player interaction, there's enough interesting areas of cooperation and competition, and the scoring is clean, clean, clean when compared to a lot of these yeah. other ones. And how the, the the so many different systems interact with that with they each come other. together very yeah. nice. The 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 very unique worker placement. All right. The, the very great, much how the great wall makes it. The the sort of you know because I'm sure there's I'm not sure how the rule book talks about making the deals about the different work collusion. Places. Yeah, it doesn't. It's silent on the issue of collusion. Exactly. Yeah. So and the fact that it happens so much and is and re, and is so rewarding during right. the game that yeah. and it happens cleanly. It's not like one yeah. of those things. In a lot of other euros, wherever collusion becomes a possibility, it bogs the game down. 
but in the Great Wall, it, it actually facilitates things getting done. And so that yeah. little level of collusion is, is, is uh, very uh, welcome. I'm surprised you didn't mention Project Elite. I don't think I'd put it there, but no, I'm surprised you didn't you bring seem, it up. You seem to be uh, pulling away from it lately. No, it's, so. not, it's not that I'm pulling away from it. I, I, I like it just fine. Uh, it's very it, it, it's a very neat real-time game. I just... Part of me uh, doesn't appreciate, first of all, that there are two editions. Neither of them are particularly ideal. And, you know, a lot of the Simon editions uh, were crufty bits of nonsense. You know, the Kickstarter bloat that, that uh, people have been accusing them forever. But Project Elite, I think, was one of those projects where it was accurate. And uh, a lot of it is just, in, in terms of uh, real-time dice rolling, uh, I'm waiting for, for Paku Paku to come and blow your mind. Paku Paku is on a very very short list of games that I have that I want you to uh, want you to play and love. Uh, the list consists of three games for worth: Paku Paku, Triumph and Tragedy, and Successors. I don't know that you'd like either Successors or Triumph and Tragedy, but I think you should try them because they're brilliant, and I would very much want them on the canon if if there was the opportunity. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I look again. I enjoy. Project Elite just fine. I, I don't know that I'd put it on the the list. Same thing with Capital X Two. Oh, really? Oh, wow. That's such a good game. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you want it on the cannon? I would put it on. Mm-hmm. Sell me. Every, ga- every gameplay is different. Mm-hmm. And none of them are weak. I wouldn't say there would be one that I would say, oh, let's not play with that one. I'm tired of that one. Or that one never works well. They, yeah, but a lot of games have variable setup and a lot of a lot of variability there. They do, but I mean, like, there's always that one that, oh, that one's boring or whatever. These all work together in, in a very simple sort of climbing type game that is easy to teach, quick to play. All right, you sold me. It's on. Capital X2. The interaction between the players, like the, I, I cannot believe you just played there. I'm like, sorry, okay? Why, why would you? That's why I said sell me, and then you I, did. I have... I you this saw bl- me going down that track. Why are you kicking I, me while I'm down? I, I acknowledge that you were right. I just wanted green. Be mag I, be I, magnanimous I, I, for once in your life. Wow, unbelievable. Uh, I'm surprised you didn't bring up Sniper Elite. Oh, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> we how not- much is your list? Is your list really 500? You said you had 500. Do you really have 500? I'm, ne- I'm nearing the end. Of it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have any hidden movement games? We do not. And this is so good. So clean. So uh, there are two two misgivings. Uh, one is... Actually, no, that's not true. I was about to say the player scaling, but it's it scales really well because if you're doing it alone, you just it moves faster. But if you're playing with other people, you get to collaborate. Yeah, okay. Sniper Elite. Sniper Elite. It is, it is the best hidden movement game we've ever played. The perfect blend of tension and cat and mouse and moments of near certainty followed by daring escapes, followed by, yeah, yeah, really, really great. I've got one last one that I want to raise, I think, that I'm not too, too sure about. And here I would like some, uh, I, I don't know one or the other. What about Whale Riders? Yeah, it should have been on my list. I saw it when I was looking through the collection mm-hmm. and I just forgot to write it down. <laughs> I don't again it's one of my favorite it, it, it's kind of like in the same class as Ethnos but better like really yeah. flexible player count and really really approachable and anyone can play it and I love every playing of it uh, and the tempo is really interesting I, 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 I don't know is it just enough there though for the length and uh, it's well it's not it's not over long that's I mean, what I mean yeah yeah for its length okay it, yeah, its yeah. weight is perfect yeah you're right and it is like the best it is one of the best recipe fulfillment games and so I think because it takes this overused and trite mechanism I think that that I think pushes it over the edge and I would suggest we include it all right all right all right well writers makes it so here's a list of uh, that, that was the end of the ones that I have written down, by the way. Yeah, I've gone through my whole list. Okay. So, the games that we are removing, uh, from the canon are Ethnos, Guards of Atlantis 1, The Crew, older one, Pandemic Fall of Rome, Concordia, and Fairy Tale. And we are adding Mission, uh, The Crew Mission Deep Sea, Green Team Wins, Force Science, Shards of Infinity, Quest for Eldorado, Agricola, Nar, Oak, Revive, Don't Lama Dice, Undaunted, Simpliciter. El Grande, Autobahn, Albedo, Pulsar, 
Quantum, Great Wall, Capital X2, Sniper Elite, and Will Riders. Sounds great. What a, that's a nice little list of games there. <laughs> well, it's already a nice list. It's joining an excellent list of games that were already there. So I, I, I'm pleased. I was afraid that there was going to be too much uh, bloat being added. Uh, but, well, not, not, that, not that they wouldn't be all excellent games. Again, all the games that we've discussed in the context of this discussion are all games that we both really, really, really like, with the exception of uh, Triumph and Tragedy, Paku Paku, and <laughs> Successors, which Walker hasn't played. I think that's great. So we're going to send these updates over to our webmaster extraordinaire, Warm Boy, the warmest of boys. The warmest. And uh, look forward to seeing that in the coming days, uh, but I don't want to speak necessarily for Warm Boy. So let's just say within the next one to 57 months, you'll see this update. Yes. No more than 57 months. Well, guaranteed. That is a guarantee you can take to the bank, Walker. Yeah. And that's going to do it for this week. Thank you very, very much for joining us for So Very Wrong About Games. We appreciate you having decided to spend the time with us. On our fabulous website, SoWrongGames.com, there is a slash contact where you can contact us with a slash, and we will read everything you send us. It's aggressive. We hope to see you again soon. Please do take care. Peace! You've been listening to So Very Wrong About Games, produced by Michael Walker and edited by Mark Bicken. Special thanks goes to What Does It Eat for generously allowing us to use their most excellent song, FOS, as our theme. You can find them at whatdoesiteat.com. You can reach us by email at soverywrongaboutgames at gmail.com or on Twitter at sowronggames. Thanks very much. See you next time, and always, try to be right, but remember you are so very wrong.